Um, like you said, this is a maximum security juvenile facility um, for the Indiana Department of Correction. And we typically we have bad kids here. They have done a lot of bad things over the course of time um, in order to, to end up arriving at, at this particular facility. Um, we have um, security transfers or um, safety and security transfers from other uh, facilities uh, that, that will come to this facility if they cause a problem and hurt somebody or uh, destroy a lot of property or things like that in one of the other facilities. But typically we house all the maximum security offenders, um, we house all the sex offenders for uh, all sex offender juveniles for the uh, Department of Correction. Um, we also have all our uh, the mental health kids are at this facility as well. So it's quite a it's quite a variety of a population. It's 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 very diverse, I guess you'd say, and that's that's very challenging for the staff to to have to work with such a diverse population, and that you don't you have to have different skills, and the staff have to be able to realize quickly what type of offender it is that they're interacting with, or what type of offender that they're needing to de-escalate because they require different techniques and so staff have to be well versed on you know, on the different styles and techniques to use for the different types of offender. I think most people would think that working in the adult system is you know, much more difficult, much more dangerous, but in fact what we hear time and time again and just being you know around the juvenile population because they are kids sometimes they can be more challenging than adults. They, I've done both, so the majority of my career was actually in the adult system, so I've probably been uh, working with juveniles for the last uh, six to seven, eight years, and juveniles are much more challenging and much more frustrating on a daily basis. Um, they, they don't think about anything. They have a thought or an emotion and they will act on it immediately. And, and most times you can't, you don't ever even see it coming. You know, you could be having a decent interaction or conversation with an offender. He could be acting just fine while he's in school. And then the very next second, he could be having an outburst and, and be hurting somebody. And it just comes out of, the, out of nowhere. And staff have to, they have to be prepared for that at any given time. And uh, we talk about that with the staff a lot. I call it a kind of a total awareness thing that they have to constantly pay attention to everything that's going on at all given time, at every given minute, because you just never know where that, that those outbursts are going to come from. So, what if you could wave your magic wand and you know have the public know or, or have politicians know what it is we really need in order to help these kids? Because by the time they come to you, a lot of damage has already happened in their past. And, and you're left to sort of pick up the pieces by this end of things because it's almost right. the last stop for them. What does it yeah. mean to do? By the, time, uh, by the time we're trying to make a difference in the lives of the, of the kids that we have at this facility, they have been through an awful lot. They've been through years and years of um, bad influences, bad role models. Uh, they've been subjected to, well, I've got, I probably have offenders here that are probably second, third, maybe even fourth generation gang members and you're trying to, to turn around their entire life. Everything that they possibly know, you're trying to, to change, change all that in, in a matter of six to eight, nine months time. And uh, it's very challenging, it's very difficult. Um, probably from my perspective, the, uh, the most challenging or frustrating thing is that we can actually make progress with some of these kids um, while they're here at this facility because I've, I've seen them go from you know when they first come in and they're just they're, they they don't comply with the rules they they're violent they're aggressive um, and then months later you, you see an entirely different individual um, somebody who is going to school and they're working hard or they just got their GED or they just graduated from the GROW program and, and they're, they're denouncing their gang and, and they're they're, they're playing and working and recreating hand in hand with rival gang members as though they were just another ordinary individual. And it's, it's amazing to see that transformation. Um, but then the frustrating point comes that then the day comes that, they, that they're going to be released. And in most cases, they end up going right back to the same environment that they were in, um, that they've been in virtually all their life. And every, any progress that you've possibly made with them 
is just gonna, it'll be all for now in a matter of seconds. I've seen offenders that have left this facility and by the time they get home, their, their, their gang members are waiting on the porch to throw them a party, a welcome home party. So, you know, all that, all that progress and effort that everybody has made over the, the course of that, that time is just, uh, it just goes right out the door. You mentioned that, you know, you have some great programs that do help these kids and we've been here and we've, we've filmed it and we've watched it. And one of those programs is um, the Grove program. Tell us a little bit about the, uh, that whole gang unit and, and the, you know, what the theory is behind it, why, it, why you think it's important to, uh, to have that here. Um, the, the GROW program, uh, which is Gang Realities in Our World, um, we developed that a year and a half ago, uh, year and a half to two years, year and a half ago, I guess it'd be. Um, and essentially what we did was we, we continued to have problems inside the facility that were, um, that were related to gang activity inside the facility. Um, so after we, we talked and had several meetings trying to decide what was the best way to, to deal with those, those offenders who were involved in the gang activity. And it was suggested um, through the course of those meetings that we just round them all up and we put them together in a unit and we put them through different types of programming. But we try to, to teach them to respect one another and to live together um, hand in hand and go to programs, go to school, go to recreation together. and. Uh, essentially remove that gang element from the rest of the general population and for no other reason so that the rest of the population could could go to programs without having that influence in their in their daily life and you know what we ended up seeing was that it actually removed an awful lot of pressure uh, from those offenders to, to have to act a certain way and when they were grouped together they ended up having to whether they were rival gang members or not, they ended up having to respect one another, respect each other's position. And you can virtually, you just, it's just amazing to be able to go in there and see, you know, rival gang members working on a Y-Tri program and being actively involved in, in a program where they're, where they're talking about, you know, their, their past and their, their gang activity and their, the bad influences in their life and those types of things in front of one another. Whereas if they were out in population, they would be wanting to take each other's head, heads off, you know. So it's it's amazing to watch that transformation. So it's it's been a it's been successful. It obviously doesn't work for for everybody, um, but even the few that I truly believe that it has made a, a difference in, um, they they have actively left that unit, gone out in the population, and worked hard to make a difference in some of the lives of the, the of the kids that we have out in the population who may be going down that that gang road as well. So. Um, it's been a it's been an important program, and I think it does make a it does make a difference. One of the kids we interviewed, well, there are a couple of kids we've been following who have come out of the Grow program. Um, uh, one, John Madden, who transitioned from the Grow program into what I think is one of the most important programs here at Pendleton now, and that's the Future Soldiers program. Right. Future Soldier program. That is, uh, I think, um, it's a it's an important program to a lot of the kids that we have at this facility because I think that in all the different things we do, whether it's education, substance abuse, the GROW program, I think the Future Soldier program truly has, um, it can really give the offenders hope and give them an alternative future. And the idea behind the program is, and it's been difficult to get through some of the bureaucratic hurdles that we're having to get through to, to make it as successful as I want it. But the idea behind it is that um, offenders inside the facility will go through the Future Soldier Program to prepare them uh, for boot camp so that they can leave this facility and go direct to into a military service, uh, whether it be uh, the Navy or the Army, the Marines, Air Force. Um, we have recruiters from all the services that come into the facility and help us work with those offenders that have been uh, been screened and identified as potential uh, recruits, um, and, and they work hard to, to help us with that program. But the the idea being that rather than an offender, rather than us throwing all these resources in the offender while he's at the facility and then returning them back to the same environment that he was in before he came here, 
And the idea is that they will go through all these programs and then when they complete the future soldier program they'll be released directly into uh, one of the military branches and leave here and go direct to a boot camp. And for a lot of these kids, this is the first time that they've seen structure in their life. Absolutely. I mean, you, I, we have taken some of our worst offenders and put them in that program and it's just made a, it's made a remarkable difference in just how they, in just their, their self-respect, their demeanor, how they conduct themselves, how they, how they hold themselves, and the respect that they give other people. Um, I hear it all the time. The staff will see a particular offender who is out there um, marching and doing drills or being respectful, and uh, they're just amazed that it's the same kid it was six months ago before he got involved in that program. And uh, it's the other thing that I think impresses me a lot is when you look at the inner strength that those kids are showing when they're doing some of the things that they're doing in front of their peers, in front of a, an offender population is very difficult. And we ask them to, to do some very challenging things and, and to, for them to be able to stand up and to, to go out on the yard or go in the gym and go through the motions of drill and ceremony and all those sorts of things. It, to do that in front of their peers, in front of this peer group is truly amazing. It, it takes a great deal of strength on their part. And ironically, some of the other offenders who are not in the Future Soldier program, who might outwardly make fun of the kids who are in it, quietly behind the scenes are applying to Absolutely. become part of the program. Yeah, it, you know, when I walk across the yard, I go into a unit, um, I get asked time and time again, you know, are we going to be able to expand the program into other housing units? And, and I would like to be able to do that someday. And, um, the, what I really, what I want to, before we get to that point is I just want to be able to say that, that the system and the program that we have in place now is we've got all the bugs worked out of it and that um, we're, we can make that program successful and we can actually, we can make a difference. We won't be able to place all of the offenders into the military service, uh, but even being involved in the program will make a tremendous difference in, in self-discipline, I believe. Um, so it's, it's, it's getting there. It's been a, it's been a tough road, but we're, we're starting to get a lot of different support so, uh, from different military branches and things like that. So it's, it's a, I think it's, it's all positive. How many kids are in the program right now? 24. We have 24 beds dedicated to it. I don't know if we have, I think we may only have 21 or 22 that are actually involved in it right now. Uh, but we do have 24 bed, uh, 24 bed units set aside for the Future Soldier Program. Tell me a little bit about your observations of John Madden, who is really one of the first to graduate. Yeah, John will, he's come a long way. Um, and he, as you could tell from your interview with him and just kind of uh, watching his demeanor, he's really uh, taking that program to heart and is really making a tremendous difference in, in his life. And I, I think that if he can, if we can, make this happen for him so that he can leave this facility and, and have him report direct to the Navy. Um, it will just, it gives him a future, it gives him the hope that he needs um, to truly make a difference in the rest of his life. And I truly believe that, that he will be a success if we can make that happen. On the other hand, if we can't make that happen and we have to send him back to the other environment, um, you know, his chances of being successful are, are greatly diminished and it's probably, it's probably a lot more likely that he will fail and he will return to this facility or even to an adult facility at some point. You know, I think a lot of people also wonder how it is kids end up here and, and they might think there are, you know, juveniles who have committed hardcore crimes, they get arrested and they are sent to Pendleton. That's not how it works. No. <laughs> Talk a little bit about how kids end up we, being sentenced here to begin with. Um, we have kids that are here for virtually everything. Uh, we do have those kids that are here for uh, committing some very serious crimes and for hurting some people very badly. Then again, we have some kids that are here for truancy. So, you know, they go through the juvenile justice system and it, it, at a certain point, you know, they, uh, the court system, uh, the juvenile system uh, is out of options and uh, out of resources as to what else to do with an offender and he ends up sentenced to the Department of Correction. And they're here until they complete our program until we say that 
that they can that they've completed the program and, and that they can leave. So they're not most of them. There are a few that we have that are here with uh, determinate sentences, but the vast majority are just here indefinitely until until we decide that they've completed the program. Kind of a final question. Um, you've worked in the adult system. You're now in the juvenile system, and obviously everyone's told us, you know. You're the guy whose heart and mind is in the right place for these kids. You, you're tough, but you're compassionate. You understand they're still teenagers. What's your ultimate goal and hope for all the kids that come through Pendleton? Wow. Um, ultimately, I, I talk to the staff about this a lot, and what what they all have to realize, regardless of their position inside the facility, whether they're a teacher or they work in maintenance or they're an officer or a counselor, their ultimate goal and responsibility is to make a difference in the lives of the, the kids that we have at this facility. And they have to recognize that we are actually here to serve the, the youth that come through this facility. And they have to, above all else, every single day they've got to think about, you know, number one, how are they going to keep the offenders and the other staff safe? and how are they going to make an impact on, on that kid's life. They're going to, in, since they are juveniles, they're going to influence that child's development one way or another, positive or negatively. They're here, they have an interaction with that juvenile every single day. And because of that, because the, the kid is still growing and maturing, they're going to influence that development. So they gotta realize that and they've gotta take, take care to, to ensure that that influence is in a positive direction. And, you know, many times people really don't think, think about that aspect of it or what a tremendous responsibility that truly is, especially when you're looking at the population group that we have, you know, kids that, are, that have been traumatized in many cases for many years. And now, you know, just to have a positive role model in their life is something that they, they in many cases, have never even been subjected to. So they, a lot of times, they don't even know how to, how to deal with that or what to think about it. So, you know, I tell my staff, you don't ever give up because you never know what's going to work today that didn't work yesterday. And, you know, what didn't work with this kid may work with this one. So you, you have to have a wide variety of programs. Um, even though we get frustrated every single day, you don't ever give up. And you continue to, to be that positive influence in their life to make that difference. So that's one thing that I, I try to talk a lot about um, because I truly believe that, you know, yeah, there are, some, there are some kids here that are beyond our help. And, you know, you, can, you, you see them and you know, you know you get frustrated and you try to figure out what can we possibly do that's going to make a difference to keep this kid from ending up in the adult system. And you keep trying to find those things and um, they, they, they get difficult. Um, but, you don't ever give up because you just never know when it, something might click with somebody. So you have to keep trying. And you have to be that positive role model and you have to, you have to keep them safe.